Let's get started. It's quarter after. We've only got an hour. Um, so thank you for coming. Uh, hopefully a bunch of you know me. Um, I'm Peter Willannon. This is a core conversation. Uh, as I said before, the goal here is to have a conversation. So hopefully you guys will use the mic. You're welcome to interrupt me in the middle. Uh, Larry's here and I say things about like what I thought whiskey was about and he will hopefully correct me and tell me which way I was wrong as the as the initiative lead because this was, again, uh, I'm just trying to put enough here on the slides to start the conversation and have us think about where where things are, where things stand today and where we want them to be in the future. Um, uh, so uh, this is being recorded. People may want to watch it later, if especially if it gets entertaining or we start throwing things. Um, so please uh, use the mic if at all possible. There's one of theirs. I said, you guys can actually come up here and sit next to me. That's fine, too. Um, but let's make sure that uh, your questions and comments get on the recording uh, for the benefit of everyone who's not in the room. Um, so the you know the big context of this is the uh, Whiskey Initiative, um, which was originally named the Web Services and Context Core Initiative. Um, and here's the goal. This was I just grabbed this from Drupal.org, uh, the groups at Drupal.org. Um, and so we can think of the, you know the biggest context as stated here was we want to basically re write Drupal such that um, it does a better job be basically being an API server, in addition to actually just serving HTML pages. And so that's, that's the big picture context. That's where, uh, you know, I think the Whiskey Initiative was trying to, trying to reach. Um, and, you know, so this discussion is kind of, maybe we can say, you know, did we reach that goal? To what extent? Um, uh, did we overreach? Uh, did we do things we didn't actually need to do to reach these goals? Um, those are, I think those are all the kind of questions I wanted to have in this conversation. Um, so later just became the web services initiative when I think context got replaced by the container, uh, basically, um, more or less, yeah, to first order. Context became plugins and uh, the Scotch initiative. Okay, so context became plugins and the Scotch initiative, kind of, but also the container to do some of the things that context was going to do. Um, so... Uh, but, you know, big pieces uh, that fell under this initiative were using the Symphony 2 kernel, um, using the Symphony container, using basically Symphony routes, uh, and towards the end, eventually, the session interface, um, using the request and response flow uh, to handle um, the whole routing and page request flow, which is something that I think if you've used other... Um, you know, Ruby frameworks or other PHP frameworks that are much more simple uh, applications or that are designed to support like a REST API, that's typically how they work. You know, you have, a, or Java APIs also, you have a request object that goes through a flow, uh, eventually you construct some content, uh, you, you build a response, the response comes back through all those same methods and, you, and on both ways through you have a chance to work with it. So that's kind of this response, request response flow. Um, and in addition to having the REST API in core, we wanted to make Drupal a better uh, uh, consumer of REST APIs. So getting a better HTTP client in core uh, was also sort of, I think, part of this broad initiative. So there was a lot. You know, this is a massive, massive initiative um, and with some clear goals and I think then you know, some um, fallout that wasn't necessarily uh, all planned or all scoped. Um, but clearly, like, one of the most important things that had to be done for this was converting essentially the routing uh, definitions in hook menu. And if we decide we want to do it like Symphony does, then we basically have to convert all of that logic into this Symphony logic in some way. Um, the Symphony system uses um, route names uh, when we're referring to a route instead of a path uh, for rendering them or referring to them. Uh, so that was a big... Uh, sort of a fundamental change in how Drupal worked, I would say. Um, and so there was a lot of hard work uh, to do these things. Like we just, those first two lines, I mean, the amount of work to do to achieve those was massive, was years of work, literally. Um, and if we count times number of people, you know, perhaps, you know, man decades <laughs> of work or women decades of work. Um, so, you know, uh, we had to, convert all the page callbacks to controllers, or at least wrap them in logic such that they appeared to be controllers, something you knew about. And then um, as we sort of broke 
Drupal's existing system in a way or started to replace it, um, there was a lot of fallout. So having to go through and, prob and uh, build uh, breadcrumbs in a different way because we could no longer pull the same information in, in sort of a hierarchical fashion out of the menu system. Um, we had to build a new menu link system. We had to build new uh, local tasks, local actions. Uh, so this wasn't, I, maybe Larry can comment. I don't think that necessarily all of this was sort of planned, um, but you know, it was sort of ended up being necessary uh, for the entire thing to work uh, when we have this fundamental shift that I showed you in the first line, which is that we're basically converting from hook menu to routes. So yeah, we're doing that, and now we've got all these other things we've got to make work in that new system. Um, so, you know, the first sort of lesson learned maybe, and I'll come back to this a couple times, is I'm not, I'm not sure we understood the scope of work that we were taking on. Um, and and that, yeah, I think that's an important lesson learned here, that if you're really going to rewrite a fundamental part of Drupal, um, there may be a lot more work uh, involved than you, you first anticipate. Um, so I think there were some, you know, some developer experience changes and, and possibly really good ones. Um, in the sense that your know, hook menu uh, was terrifically overloaded, and it was often like I don't even remember what all the things do. If you give me a ex particular example of hook menu, I wouldn't necessarily tell you be able to tell you with looking at it what the outcome is going to be in terms of all the things that are defined, the menu links, the you know contextual links, local actions. Some of them are obvious, some are less obvious. Um, so I think you know we had a great uh, change here, and that we sort of split up those concerns. We now, it's very clearly defined it, for each of those subsystems, you know, where they're defined, how they're defined, what they're doing, um, and we don't have this intermixing anymore. So we have, I put here MM for my module. So, you know, we now basically have uh, the pieces that were all coupled together in that one hook that returned data are basically split out now into five different YAML files in, in a typical implementation. Uh, and that's, I think, better, you know, but we could have done that uh, in, even Drupal 7 or in Drupal 8, without changing the routing system, we could have made this split. So that, this, we, we had a nice side effect of improved developer experience, but I don't think that we should uh, say that, that the rest of those changes were necessary to, to achieve better developer experience. Um, and just in case any of you don't remember what hook menu looks like, <laughs> you know, it's, it's okay, it's an array, there's, you know, nothing's very, um, Strict, you have to know that, you know, this thing that we passed in the array, like the number one, right, that's an, an array index into something else, uh, which happens to be the parts of the path. And that percent node means that there's a function called node load and maybe several other specially named functions. And, you know, they're just specially named functions. They're not really um, strictly controlled. And as, as with hooks in general, you can have name collisions. You know, so, and then... Yeah, type. So this is a local task, but I think it would probably also make a menu link. Eh, what does wait do? Well, I think that was only for the local task. It didn't actually affect the routing part of it, right? <laughs> so it's, you know, this was really overloaded. And as I said, you know, a single line in here might affect many things. And um, you didn't necessarily have the kind of control or clarity, uh, you know, about what these were doing. Um, if we look at the equivalent in Drupal 8, now this is only the routing. So this, we know here, this is not going to have any side effects. All we're doing is defining a route. Um, uh, but you'll notice like the route name, entity node.version history. What does that have to do with anything? Um, uh, we have some funny underscore controller, underscore node access revision. It's not necessarily obvious what these do. Uh, it's not as obvious as defining, uh, you know, a callback function. Uh, this node backslash D plus. You guys know what that means? Yeah. Well, he does, but... <laughs> right, so, you know, in this case, we're actually defining a regular expression that has to match that parameter in the path. Um, so that's um, nice. Node operation route, I don't even know what that does. So, um, you know, I, I think we could say you know, there was an improvement, but, it, but these things are still not obvious, you know, unless you work with them every day about what they're doing. Um, and I think we have some, some real problems in Drupal 8 uh, for developers or for people that are beginning developers especially, which is um, you know, Drupal 7, if you looked at a call to the URL function, you would basically see a path in there. Um, and so it was usually pretty obvious, you know, like what link kind of link am I rendering? Where, what link is that going to be on the page? Uh, it was a lot more, you know, intuitive. Um, so, and if, if I'm rendering based on a uh, 
route name in Drupal 8, and I see a piece of code rendering a route name, and I want to visit that page in the browser. How do I do that? Mm. Yeah, so you grab the code base YAML files or use Drupal console to look up the route and find the path. So it's, you know, it's a little more indirect. It's not as discoverable, right? You can't just say, call the URL. I'm going to copy paste that in my browser. Um, uh, and then the, the inverse problem, right? I'm on a path in my Drupal UI and I want to know what route provided that path. In Drupal 7, you know, 50-50, you could grab the code base to find the, the hook menu entry. It still wasn't, I don't think, that easy all the time, um, but still a little harder in Drupal 8. There's probably tooling we should put into Drupal Core to provide more debug information. Um, so that's, that's a possible part of this discussion if people want to talk about, you know, if they have things already built or they have ideas about what should be in Drupal Core. Um, again, let's discuss. Um, you can go to the mic now if you have an idea. Um, uh, and again, just to you know, compare those things. So in Drupal 7, yeah, we have this URL function we call node 1, or we concatenate a string. Um, it, you know, it was pretty easy to explain. In Drupal 8, we've moved, um, you know, in part thanks to Tim, I think, to moving using this URL object as sort of the common interface to link rendering, because before that, it was really a mess. Uh, um, you know, and it's not necessarily that bad. We actually have this entity URI. Do people know about that? Um, so if you want to render a link to an entity, you can put entity type slash entity ID, which conveniently happens to be the same as the Drupal system path in most cases. Um, so there are actually, you know, ways to do this uh, relatively easily in Drupal 8, but I think a lot of people don't even know that these things exist. Um, and what you would often try to do is try to do the thing on the last line, right, which is, like I'm gonna spend the time to find the route name and now I'm gonna call this from route method and I have to you know, use this completely non-intuitive route name uh, and parameters and call to string on it if I want a string. Um, so again, I think, I think you know, part of the, the fallout we're still dealing with is trying to communicate to people what the best practice is that you know, maybe some of these you know, shortcuts like using entity URIs uh, are the things you should do almost all the time and um, that conveniently maps to something that looks like a path and, and it's going to be a lot easier for people as they start writing this code to, to use those. Um, there are, I think, at least in one or two cases, uh, important performance improvements that we got by using route names. Uh, and I could tell you about this because I wrote the hacks in Drupal 6 and 7 that allowed us to not have to do this so much in Drupal 6 and 7. Um, but in particular, if we're rendering something from a route name, um, or in this previous case, if from an entity URI, that's basically one step removed through a lookup to the entity class or entity annotation to find the route name. So it's almost as good, not quite as good, or if in this last case, we're directly rendering the route name. Um, there's no mystery about what we're doing. We don't have to um, uh, do extra work to do the access check. So in Drupal 6 or Drupal 7, if you were trying to do an access check on a URL, um, you would basically, or a path, you would basically have to run the thing through the entire routing system uh, to basically find uh, the access callback, right, and then check the access callback. And, you know, so there was a, an a whole extra step there where you're trying to break down that path and find the corresponding route, as we, you know, you might call it in Drupal 6 or 7. Um, and in Drupal 8, again, you have a, an immediate lookup um, that makes this thing potentially uh, much less work to uh, access check. Um, so one reason why we didn't worry so much this, about this in Drupal 6 and 7 was the primary use case for access checking rendered links is the menu link system. And there's actually a special hack in uh, Drupal code, which is, is sort of beautifully ugly. Um, the special case is node links and assumes that they're going to work as node pages and uh, therefore bypasses that whole routing part to find uh, the correct route. <laughs> so, you know, it's beautifully ugly. I can see Klaus's grimacing. <laughs> um, what's even better is, is it serializes an array with references between elements in the same array and then unserializes it and you still get these like ref internal array references still work after unserializing. It's, it's really... <laughs> <laughs> Who knew PHP supported these things, right? <laughs> um, so, 
you know, and and I think maybe the route name is is a in some cases a win for developer experience, right? So now it's very explicit um, which parts of the path are the parameters uh, versus uh, you know the machine name. You know, if you see just someone writing a, a URL, they're not going to just write that. It's either it's going to be in some format where you very quickly say this is the parameter and this is either the machine name or the entity name, and we're going to go look up the machine name of the route from the entity. Um, the other thing here that's been argued as being an important win uh, was that this whole system allows you to change things, uh, including reordering the order of parameters to your uh, controllers um, and to change the path uh, that a, a particular route renders to uh, without changing the rest of your code. Um, and I've certainly heard about this as, as, a, as a goal, Larry. I don't know if you have any feeling about whether that was actually a considered an important goal or is just sort of you know, one of the things that was said was important later? <laughs> so two parts to that. Um, using machine names instead of paths is something we just kind of inherited when we decided to use the Symfony router because that's how it worked. That there were people pushing to have that level of separation already, and so it gave them that feature. The degree to which we've taken advantage of that, I honestly don't know. Um, but that was kind of a, some people wanted it, and we kind of got it for free along the way, so cool. Yeah. Well, and it allows to have, like, multiple routes with the same path, which we do for REST, for example, right? Or is that yeah, not? That, yeah. that, that was the other uh, big thing we wanted was um, multiple routes on the same path that can branch on something other than just the URL, which... Yeah, you need some unique identifier then, other than the um, uh, other than the path pattern for that to work. And did we necessarily need to put the machine names through the entire system quite as far to do that? Potentially not, um, but we can talk more about that later. At least regarding the last point, um, I think it's kind of pointless because if you vendor a link, it is the same URL if it's if it varies by something else. So. Um, regarding the pure linking part of things, it's a little bit of a weak argument. But I think in general, um, there's better, better discoverability in a way. So, well, and this is what Larry just mentioned, right? That, yeah, we, there is a win here in that, yeah, now we can have multiple routes with the same path because they have distinct machine names. Um, and in particular, the HTTP methods having distinct controllers for different methods I think was very important to kind of this concept of making Drupal support a REST API, right? So we can certainly say that this, this particular gain was central to that whole initiative and was clearly, I think, the whole community bought into. Um, um, and, you know, it lets us do other interesting things even beyond something like HTTP methods. We could actually define uh, routes that look like this, like node slash bracket node, which is a, a placeholder or a slug. And in one case, we could have backslash D plus, which means it's numeric. In another case, we could have, um, you know, something that would match like a UUID. Um, you know, is that important? You know, are people going to use that facility in core or contrib? I'm not sure. Um, uh, but maybe, maybe that's a win. So you really can limit, you know, matching the things your route really wants to match. And you can ignore the things you don't really want to match and let someone else take care of it. Um, so, yeah, could we have done it differently? Um, I think this is, maybe at this point it doesn't really matter because we are, you know, we're, we are where we are, but, you know, just, you know, for, for, for a brief second, we'll take a look back and say, um, you know, could we have, as Larry said, gone less thoroughly towards using, you know, route machine names everywhere and kept something uh, it was more like a path-based system. Um, you know, could we have even used, I think you could maybe have even used basically the paths as the machine names for the most part. Um, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think, I think we, yeah, we adopted sort of this existing system and, and again, without necessarily considering the amount of work and fallout for other subsystems within core. Um, you know, at this point, um, you know, maybe we should be focusing on educating people on the best practice. They should maybe use these entity URIs. Uh, or Daniel suggested we should maybe even have a more compact format uh, or just somehow better support a simple path 
base linking for people, let's say, in Twig templates or someplace where they're not access checking. They want to link to some page on the site. They don't really care. They want it to always be there. Um, but they want to get the path processing. They want to get the language prefixing. They want to get other things uh, that come as a side you know, benefit of actually using the correct um, link rendering system. Um, so maybe there's a way we need to make it easier for people to do that uh, without them knowing a special uh, URI prefix that you have to put in front of your path to make it work. Yeah, I think we should definitely do that because um, it decouples our routing system from the template systems. Mm. I mean, we, in case we ever want, would, would like to render stuff in JavaScript, I mean, we don't want to expose the routing system into <laughs> uh, into trick <laughs> JS or something. Yeah, I, I, I agree that have the entity URIs are a good abstraction that helps, you know, helps with that separation. I don't think we want to go back to putting raw URLs into code because as soon as you do that once, that becomes another place you have to update at any time you want to change or even consider touching that URL. Um, Again, it's not something we necessarily do often, but there were contrib modules in D7. Chris Vanderwater, if he was here, could talk to that in a lot more detail, where he was actually you know, moving pages around on the site uh, from a module, which you can only do if that path is fully abstracted to the route, because then everything links to the route. You can change the path and do all kinds of fun stuff there. So there are things you can only do if you fully banish paths from the, um, from the code base. That said, alternate URI formats that also provide that same abstraction level, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, well, I guess, I guess that's the hard part because for the average theme developer, let's say, like they may not understand the abstraction, and but they know exactly where they want, what URL they want to link to. So I mean, they is, I mean, there are people building like Drupal sites without the Drupal thing. Um, I mean, they, they build the the theming aspect first or separated to the actual Drupal site. So there is no routing there. Right. Yeah, I guess that's, uh, yeah, in that case, you wouldn't really have advantage of the path processing or something. But certainly, yeah, I've heard of people building essentially static sites or a theme that, you know, essentially renders the full site, you know, before, yeah, they put any Drupal content into it. So I think the idea with um, using the path as the machine name might not be too bad, right? Because we need to make up an identifier. And, and currently, for this node example here, this would be entity.node.something, I don't know. And if we make the string up anyway, we can just use the path. And for most of the routes, it will work because there is only one route on the path. Sometimes we have multiple routes on one path, so we need some suffix or prefix or whatever. But it's still a much better developer experience because you immediately see uh, where that URL goes to. Um, so when somebody reviews the code, they have an idea what's going on. I mean, it's tricky because, I mean, one reason why we have this entity dot entity type dot canonical thing is that we can generate paths uh, or generate routes automatically. And, yeah. and the, the other downside to me to using the paths is then you don't know uh, which one is which, if it's a path or if it's a route name, especially if you don't have any slugs in it. It can get very confusing very quickly. The only place I know that we still use paths for things are tests, and that doesn't bother me because it's okay if your test breaks, because then it means you need to fix your test. Well, at least regarding the point of uniqueness, I mean, the slash pretty much indicates it, whether it's a path or a route. I think in practice, most of our hard-coded routes have a machine name that's more or less based off the path anyway in practice. You know, as, as Daniel said, the, the, route, the uh, entity routes have a specific naming format because there's a lot of automation built around them. But for just an arbitrary path, you're sticking a form somewhere. All of mine are basically you know, the uh, module name dot path with slashes converted to dots, and that works fine. So that it, you don't have to think that hard about a route name when coming up with one. And if you are, then don't. <laughs> you, you don't need to stress that stress about it that much. Uh, I mean, specifically when we're talking about linking to something, we actually have like these internal URIs, so you can actually um, like not saying whether that's like a good or bad thing or a good or bad idea or whatever, but like it's actually possible to just link to a path. Um, so, like we could actually have linking 
be completely separate from the discussion of whether we need route names or paths as route names or whatever. So, yeah, that's true. But it's entirely not obvious for like a theme developer right. <laughs> how to do that. Well, there's actually two different ways to do that, right? So one is the internal scheme, and one is the base scheme. Right, and yeah, or there's maybe more, and those one of those will check access and apply path aliases, and another the other one won't. And you know which is which one will do which, right? Yeah. No. <laughs> well, I mean, I've I've long said that you need to be like a senior developer to generate a link in Drupal, <laughs> and it's I mean it's true, it's actually true. Like with all like if you yeah. want to know everything about link generation, then you have to be at least senior level, like at least. <laughs> oh. Part of the reason for that, you know, Tim just noted over here that there's nine different ways of generating links. Most of the reason for that is not the routing system per se, it's other systems that were in development in parallel. And as soon as link generation ran into the render caching system, everything broke. And so the end result we ended up with that makes things work with both routing and uh, the cache system is you know, you, URI objects with abstracted values that get rendered later because then we can track their cache contexts for things that may come in via a outbound URL path processor that alters an, alt, an arbitrary link, and it just gets weird. Drupal's contexts, you know, Drupal does all kinds of crazy things in crazy places. So it, the, the reason there's so many layers there is um, we kept trying to, to abstract it enough <laughs> that it stopped breaking caching, uh, and by the time we finished, we didn't have time to convert all the others over anymore. So there was a discussion at the last DrupalCon about, okay, there's two ways you should be using, let's just get rid of all the others. I don't know how far it went since then, but we did have a meeting about that. So hopefully we, we shouldn't have to be a senior in engineer to make links in the future. Yeah, so I think, yeah, that or may be more than, methods. that may be at this point more the Drupal 9 discussion. <laughs> One concrete uh, suggestion: What we could uh, do. Um, I mean, often like there's one really weird thing, which is entity to URL. Like, why? Why is it the other way around? Um, so I think we should have URL from entity, and you can pass in the entity object, um, because that makes URL still the primary thing, and it also takes it takes into account the fact that entities are one of the most important things in Drupal. Okay, so. And core patch will be working on on Friday. <laughs> um, so, you know, I think one of the other you know, things we talked about is, as an important feature, right, that we using route names allowed us to match at the same path different HTTP met methods. And we also originally had a concept that we were going to do um, header based uh, content negotiation for the response format. Um, now, in the end, it turned out that we threw that away, basically. It's still supported by core, but it's not used by core. We switched to using uh, query parameters for content negotiation because in the real world, uh, there are caching proxies all over the place, and they don't necessarily read the headers uh, of the request, and they don't necessarily give you back uh, the content that you asked for. And if you're using Safari, it's broken. Safari is the reason we can't do this even when you control the proxy server. So screw you, Safari. Yeah. So, you know, so this is, you know, I think at one point was a, a significant motivation um, for, our, for a routing system where we focus on the route name and, again, have many paths, uh, many of the same path that can, could resolve. Um, but, you know, so I, I think a little bit looking back, you know, question, could we have done it differently? Could we have enabled um, multiple routes at the same path, let's say, in Drupal 7 with much less change? Could we have, you know, suffixed the path name with the HTTP methods that were supported or something? If that was the sole use case, was, was making that, that um, sort of REST API uh, more possible? Um, and as Daniel said, when you're rendering link, you're always basically rendering a Git link. So uh, in that case, it wouldn't really have mattered that much. Um, so, um, you know, I think looking back, uh, it is, it's um, hard to say what the, you know, so what is the lesson learned here? I think uh, the, that conversion of path throughout, as I said, created a lot of sort of unplanned, unexpected uh, work or work that wasn't, realized or was underestimated maybe when, when it was first proposed. Um, uh, 
whether or not it extended the Drupal 8 release, I, I could say yes to be provocative, though I think what's interesting is you think about the, uh, the, like the dynamic page cache, you think about uh, auto-escaping and Twig, you know, a lot of those problems were also not actually solved until the last minute, so the, it's unclear if we had refocused the effort of the developers who were working on routing and menu related things, would we have solved all those sooner or do we simply need you know, a lot of development time to get those? And in a way we sort of got Drupal eight and a half, um, you know, cause we finished those efforts um, by the time we got Drupal eight done. Um, and so I, I'm not sure, you know, so if, if we had said everything was done sooner and we didn't have those other features, would we have gone ahead um, and, you know, enabled them in what would have been Drupal nine? Um, Maybe. Um, so, you know, I've already mentioned this, that, yeah, we might have, we might have done things more easily. I don't think at this point it makes sense to go back. Uh, so, but maybe in terms of, of when we're looking at some, uh, Drupal code that is, uh, well, well established, uh, we need to think harder about what the impact is of changing that, especially if it has side effects. Um, and in the end, we actually ended up using the Drupal algorithms from Drupal 6 and 7, essentially behind a facade of Symfony um, interfaces because what Drupal did was beyond the scale of what a normal Symfony routing system would handle. So um, to me, it's a little unclear whether, whether it was really a win to adopt these components because we ended up having to essentially just use them in front of our, our existing algorithms um, and so maybe we could have shortcut uh, those code paths a little bit, or maybe we still could. So that's certainly one thing I think we should discuss um, is like how much of the using that Symphony system uh, is critical now? How is there a part of it that we could, you know, short circuit or reduce or make more compact? Uh, and both in terms of the sort of developer experience of understanding how Drupal works uh, and also in terms of possibly performance. Um, the other thing in terms of you know, where we go from here is there's probably a lot of work left if we actually wanted to convert 100% you know, of references to paths uh, to route names or any URIs. As Tim mentioned, probably the vast majority of what's left is in test cases. And in a lot of cases, you know, for the test, it's not a big deal if it breaks, so maybe this is work that could sort of de be deferred almost forever or, you know, made as, you know, novice patches for someone who wants to just cut their teeth. Um, the other piece I think that we don't know yet, uh, and maybe people here have feedback, is are there going to be sites or are there contrib modules where people really want to take these, you know, existing routes, let's say, the, you know, so the, the use case is like the node route. And I, instead of node, I don't want the word node to be my URLs anywhere. I want it to always say content, or I will always want it to say some word in uh, your preferred language uh, that describes content. Um, and so I want to go in and I'm going to alter all of the routes uh, and I'm going to change the path. And that should be possible, but are people actually going to do that? Uh, or again, you know, for the case of the module refactoring, is module refactoring where I need to change the paths uh, but not change the route names, is that going to occur often enough uh, that it's really an important feature? Um, or if we went to rendering, you know, and sort of made it easier to just use the paths, uh, would that be that much of a, a downside in the long run? Um, so I think that's, you know, that's certainly a point if people have opinions on, I'd like to hear your opinions or, or what you've done so far with your modules or your sites. Are people using these, these features? Um, Another important feature we have, right, is the case that we're loading, you know, all the possible routes that match a path, and then we're basically filtering them down uh, to the one that we say is the best match. That's how Drupal, the Drupal 8 system works, which is sort of adopted more or less, I guess, from Symfony. Um, so, um, you know, so possibly that's going to be important for things like panels in Drupal 8, because now we have, for panels, that means that's an almost native way for it to support page variants. Right, so it can have many different routes uh, for the same path. It can look at the incoming request. It can say, what's the variant, uh, the route that should match this? And now I have a very clean and, and you know, 
way to do that 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 is within the this, the API and not sort of rebuilding the whole API. Hopefully, they will choose to do it that way and not rebuild the whole API. Um, but at least it's possible, or you can think of other projects where, you know, again, if you have these variants or you have sections of the sites that should behave a little differently for nodes in this section of the site versus nodes in the other section of the site, um, now we have a little bit more built-in support uh, for the notion that, you know, uh, the same path uh, could end up being rendered differently or, or rendered by a different controller. Um, so and to the extent that those things are important, you know, can we uh, cut down the code? Can we uh, make it more streamlined without losing, the, you know, sort of that important feature? Um, so I think that's, you know, these are sort of, for me, the questions in Drupal 9 that there's, you know, I don't, I don't see it as feasible at this point to go back um, to what we had because going back to what we had would be so much work um, that we would just all give up and I don't know, what's what's the new framework of the day? We'd all take up Java. I mean, <laughs> it would be that bad. <laughs> um, but, you know, this is, this is kind of, you know, I was looking uh, just at like the call stack to get to the point where we actually do routing in Drupal 8. And this is kind of, I think, what the call stack looks like for an authenticated page request. And this is this is the actual call stack, not all the function calls that happened. And you know, this is only to the point of where we're we're starting to build the route collection. We don't even this isn't even getting the route filtering and calling the controller, which would have been you know that much more. Um, so to me, it seems some of these things I think are fine, um, and you'd, we don't really need to optimize them. So the middleware in particular, if people are familiar with the concept of middleware, I, I don't think that that's problematic to be in the call stack um, because it's very easy to describe to people like the role the middleware plays um, and how to basically go from, okay, just imagine there's no middleware or imagine we pass through the, all the middleware and now what's next in terms of documenting or explaining the routing system. Um, but I think uh, we then get to a little trickier system where we have multiple levels of routers and we're using you know, this kernel event and basically, I mean, I, I understand that's the way Symphony does it, but I think it it means it's, well, on the one hand, you could replace this whole thing with your own system. So um, on the other hand, do we need that level of flexibility and did we need to follow that model? So Larry looks like he has, wants to say something about that. Um, so a couple of points I can, I'll say on that. I'm not going to disagree with you necessarily. Uh, what I'll say is one of the reasons that we use the Symphony system kind of as is, in, in a sense, um, it was quite frankly to shortcut the bike shed mm. because this gave us a existing architecture that we could say, all right, these decisions are already made. We're not going to argue those. We're just going to argue the next layer up. And I felt that would, and I think did, uh, save us a lot of debate time because we could just use an architecture off the shelf, even if it wasn't perfect, it was still something that would work. And clearly it does work. Um, could we simplify pieces of it now after we get a better sense of which you know which flexibility points are actually used probably I think another advantage um, you're talking about the the scope question of you know just how much did we have to change it was impossible to know before we started precisely because so many systems were implicitly coupled to each other and one of the big wins in Drupal 8 is things are less tightly coupled and where there's overlaps it's more obvious so you know were we to try and say okay now let's make some major surgery to the routing system it'll be easier for us to figure out just what the scale of that is the way Drupal 7 was architected everything spidered into everything so much that uh, you know pulling pulling one thread everything turned out to be attached to it uh, that's why loosely coupled or fully decoupled components that you can mix and match adds more architecture for those seams between them, but gives you the ability to rip out pieces uh, in a more controlled fashion going forward. So uh, yes, it was painful. Um, yes, we probably still need to iterate on it, but I think we're in a better position now to iterate intelligently than we could possibly have been before. So that I still think was a, a step forward. There are definitely still more steps forward to take. I just want to say, I think the conclusion you just said is, is spot on, but I think the beginning was, was not. Uh, there's no way that you can say, we're going to replace the routing system and we don't know what it'll affect 
if you look at a single hook menu definition. Like we know there are eight things in there and we knew in our inner minds that we were gonna have to fix it all, but no one wanted to say that out loud because then none of the release managers would have let us change the routing system <laughs> because it would have taken five years, which is like what it did. But saying that we didn't know what it would affect is just bullshit. Yeah, I can't agree more. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's because Daniel and I did all the work that Larry started. Like, that was where we ended up. <laughs> um, anyway, um, I wanted to go back to that slide here. Um, as you said, like, the middlewares, sure, they, they are kind of optional, but then there's a, this thing called access aware router, chain router, chain router dynamic router, nested matcher. And there's, yeah, I think we should improve it there. <laughs> it is, I mean, decoupling code or your architecture is really nice. It's in the case where you actually have a use case to replace those components. I doubt that anyone in the room ever replaced the routing system. Or add a, a fast router in advance. Right. I mean, I theoretically that's possible, but in practice it's basically impossible because access checking and authentication and everything. So I think we should maybe collapse down at least three or four of those things. <laughs> Uh, just uh, on the scope um, scope issue again, I think you're kind of right that it was, or I mean, I want to disagree with Tim to a certain extent. I think you're right that probably people knew that this was going to be like a huge thing if we just like rip out the entire routing and write it new. But I don't think that anyone like, I don't think it was that we just had it in our head and no one was like, or no one was uh, daring to say it or anything. I don't think anyone was aware like specifically of the things that we were going to encounter like then like two years after we we introduced symphony routing people noticed that we don't have like the menu tail thingy or that like with all sorts of language stuff that that ended up being broken like years after and stuff like that so i don't think we ever and i think that was a pretty big mistake um that we never actually got to a point where we had like a um a plan like scoped out. So this is going to be how it's going to, like these are the steps that we need to take. Um, and I also think that that was the reason that we basically had to like port Drupal core to the new routing system like five different times. Um, so at first like we created all the routes and then it was like underscore content and then, but then we changed it back to underscore controller uh, but then some of them act to underscore form, and then we have underscore entity form, and then the access changed, and then we had like options and parameters, and then we just remove them again because we can auto generate them. And this is like just the routing file. Like there's, um, and like each of those steps sort of made sense. Each like when you look at each one of them, but I think there was just an immense amount of work that we basically just lost um, of people over and over converting like these huge chunks of core to an API that's like obsolete two or three months later. Um, and I actually wanna like, um, I thought about this a little bit and I think the, the new semantic versioning that we now have um, kind of gave me an idea of that we can maybe uh, learn from that because now we can add the experimental modules and like have it in, in the core repo and like let it mature for a while before we like say, okay, this is a good thing. Um, and I don't really think you can put like routing in a module, um, but maybe we can find a way to have things in core um, and just let them rest or let them mature for a while until we say, okay, this is good. This is gonna work for a couple use cases. And we're still gonna refactor it maybe once or twice, but maybe not 10 times. Um, yeah, and I wanna say one other thing. Um, uh, like in regards to the to the URL um, generation and like maybe routing in the future in general, um, I think actually with the, with the entity stuff, we can see that it's a really good thing when we move away from like, especially for DX and for themers and um, module developers, when we move away from like these low level concepts of I have a uh, a page like I, I have to write the routing YAML I have to do this. I think it's better if we move towards um, I mean, the entity, like you have an entity and I want to link to the entity. Um, and I have another thing like a config form or whatever, I want to link to the config form. And now the config form has a menu link somewhere. And so I have like this, con like a, a smart config form 
whatever object that has like a tool URL or like I, I don't care about the actual API, but I think um, in general it's a good thing to to sort of find uh, semantic higher level concepts um, that make it just the code more readable um, and make it easier for yeah everyone involved. Wow. Um. Another thing is I wanted to say, I think we made a mistake in the way how we converted things. Um, so I assume we would start on the left side, that's status quo, and right side is our end goal. We start of, kind of started to fix stuff on the end goal side, but then like had nothing in between. I think it would have been much better on like in, retros in retro perspective to actually come from the left side and continuously improve until the end. So I completely agree that we've had a ton of wasted work uh, over the course of the cycle. So my apologies to anyone who was involved in any of that. Um, I, I will, however, point out, please remember this, that five years later, our processes are a lot better. There's still a lot of problems with them, but we actually have semantic versioning now. We have dates. Drupal in 2011 had no clue what its timeline was, had an active opposition culturally to big plans, and wouldn't accept a proposal until code was written. Which meant just convincing people, hey, we should do X, that's a, you know, a step towards you know, things 15 steps later. Until we had that 15 steps later thing for people to look at, nobody in a leadership position would accept even step one. We ran into that ton. The first year of the Whiskey Initiative was spent trying and failing to convince people, yes, we should actually do something. Um, so you know, a lot of that were not technical reasons, but process fail reasons in Drupal, many of which have improved since then, some have not. Uh, I do think the new round of initiatives are being run a lot better than the Drupal 8.0 initiatives were in many ways um, because of the bruises and uh, bloody messes <laughs> that the old ones left behind. Um, but yeah, a lot of it was simply the way core development works um, or worked, you know, limits what you can do. And we tried to have larger stepwise plans and do this thing which will support this thing, which will support that thing, and we got told no. Um, so hopefully we'll do better in the future about having plans that we and roadmaps we can actually deal with. We've got dates now. We've got more people who are paid to work on core now, which is wonderful, because now we have predictable resourcing, at least more predictable than we did five years ago. Um, which also makes it easier to say, you know, how much work can we take on? None of the initiatives could answer that question. Now the, the new initiatives can answer that question or at least make an educated guess. So that should be a lot smoother going forward, whether that's you know, workflow initiative, migrate, or you know, routing D9 initiative, whatever that becomes. Mm -hmm. I think there was just a core process proposal that is more almost accepted of trying to create a new issue queue for large-scale plans and large architecture discussions and getting those signed off before anyone actually starts making patches. Yeah, I. it's like the fourth or fifth iteration of attempting to get approval on a concept before someone writes code, mm -hmm. which we desperately need as a process <laughs> uh, to avoid that kind of waste. Yeah. Um, so hopefully these process issues will improve and that will give us better uh, and more efficient code development. Um, so almost to the end of the slides here, and I'm glad that we had the discussion throughout as opposed to saving it for the end. Um, so as we said, maybe we can reduce the overhead on the router. Maybe we can, you know, compress it or remove some components. I think the debate there is going to be like, which of those things count as being, you know, we have to have for backward compatibility versus which ones are internal details of the API and people... <laughs> shouldn't complain too loudly if we, you know, juggle the internal details. Um, you know, and I think in terms of performance, hopefully we could make that a little better. Um, you know, I certainly remember writing the, you know, in the Drupal 6 code initially that, you know, every single function call Dries looked at personally because it was in, you know, the critical path to delivering the page. And, you know, now we have a lot more code running. Uh, we haven't had that level of scrutiny. And again, maybe that's in some ways good because we, it allowed us to decouple the pieces uh, they're not as, you know, closely intertwined, but um, I think a problem that certainly remains right now is that this, this you know, call stack is not really what, that well documented on Drupal.org. 
I think even like for myself, like trying to step through it with a debugger, I very quickly confused about like what's actually happening at what point in the process in terms of sessions, authentication, you know, when you're building the response, when do you actually figure out which route you're, you're taking. And so I think, you know, to, to an extent that simplifying that code path would, would make this easier, but uh, even if we don't simplify it, we need to do a better job documenting it um, and giving, you know, people sort of a, a high level understanding of the, of the different steps and what they're doing and, and why they're there. Um, you know, and, and, you know, in terms of improving performance, I, I think there's maybe Symphony code we're using that we don't need. Um, you know, so our database query basically matches all the fixed strings in the path. And then we go into a Symphony compiled route and we run a regular expression to match the fixed strings in the path. Uh, you know, there's, there's things like that we could probably cut out. It wouldn't really affect uh, the API or the developer experience, but it might uh, improve performance or reduce the number of, you know, regular expressions and things we're running uh, in order to find the right, the, the right route. So that's all I have. We can certainly discuss some more. Um, but yeah, we may, if you guys don't know about sprints on Friday, hopefully people coming to this kind of session do. Uh, certainly, uh, please come on Friday and come over the weekend to the extended sprints, uh, which were a lot of fun last weekend, um, and evaluate this so that people think that you know I had something to say and wasn't just <laughs> trolling Larry. <laughs> so thank you, and we can. We have a few more minutes, so you don't have to leave, but, you know. Um. So, um, for Drupal 8, yes, I think we can do some simplification as long as we take a narrow definition of what the current API is. I, I think there are plenty of things we can clean up there. Um, for Drupal 9, I'm going to open a can of worms and say, for Drupal 9, we should be using PSR 7 natively. Mic drop. To explain what that means, because... So, Right now, we're using the request and response objects defined in the Symfony HTTP Foundation library and the Symfony HTTP kernel. PSR7 is the framework interoperability group specification for request and response objects. Uh, and there are middleware standards coming out from FIG soon. They're in development now that a large number of other projects are uh, adopting. Basically, HTTP Foundation was the PHP uh, request response version one. PSR7 is the PHP request response version two um, that almost everyone except Symfony is now adopting. Symfony may or may not go that way by Symfony four. That's a very open question at the moment. Um, but I think by the time, you know, since Drupal 9 is still several years away, I would like to see us, when that actually happens, switch to a PSR7 based pipeline which may or may not entail removing uh, some of the Symfony components, depending on what Symfony d does in the meantime. Uh, but I think, you know, speaking from the perspective of decoupling and interoperability win, in the future that is where that win is, is with uh, the FIG-based HTTP handling, which I don't know what all the knock-ons of that are gonna be. <laughs> this is why if you're not doing routing, you should not be t uh, looking at the request object yourself. <laughs> Don't look at the request object, and you're insulated from everything I just said. Yeah, um, one comment regarding that: like, is there any way to do that in a BC compatible way? Like, I mean, we don't want to convert everything again, rather, and instead we could like have a smooth transition and slowly convert things over like during the D8 cycle. And then like D9 would be just, boom, we just use PSR7 instead of what we have at the moment. Yeah, I think there's some yeah. kind of adapter, right? So you could maybe give a controller that needs the Symphony request could get the Symphony request and yeah. it would we, be We already up. have that. Yeah. Uh, that made it in, so right after PSR7 came out, mm -hmm. Symphony released a bridge library that can convert back and forth between the two. And we snuck that into the last minute in uh, Drupal 8. So as of today, if you have a controller, you can type into it, you know, it, uh, its signature to get a PSR7 request object, and you can return a PSR7 response object. And we handle the conversion at that level. Ideally, we'd be using a PSR7 object all the way through. Um, that would mean you know, we, we could put the translation and an outer middleware, and then have PSR7 middlewares, and then um, found HTTP foundation stuff in the middle.
but then you might have to convert back. And there is a cost every time you convert. Um, so maybe it depends how much we're willing to convert of the other stuff. The other thing to keep in mind is that uh, the symphony uh, request object and the response object are mutable, so you can use them as a global variable, uh, essentially. The PSR7 object is immutable, so while you can still attach extra metadata to it, just like the Symphony one, um, you can't just stick it in a global and access it, uh, like stick it in a container and access it like we do now. So there are some things that it by design very deliberately keeps you from doing with a request because you have no business doing it, not that that ever stopped us in Drupal. <laughs> um, so there, there are probably ways that we could you know, stage that transition, but there are large chunks where it would be um, highly problematic, like anything using the Symphony kernel events needs a Symphony object, not the PSR7 object. One thing we maybe should also do for Drupal 9 is to look at HTTP 2 and whether we could leverage that somehow in our system to improve performance. Um, another thing is we currently really struggle with streaming stuff. So for example, BigPipe is streaming constantly its HTML and its data out. And HTTP, uh, HTTP Foundation is really not the best tool for that. Uh, maybe PSR 7 helps. Maybe it doesn't, but in case it doesn't, we should maybe check out some other solution because it's kind of problematic, especially because I think the world moves more towards streaming in general. Okay, well, I think we're about at time, so wrap up so we, you guys have time to get to the next session, but thank you for attending and thank you for all the discussion. <laughs>